Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May God add his blessing to the reading the hearing, the understanding, and the warming of all of our hearts as we come to full knowledge of what God has in store for us. From this, the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. So we just had an opportunity to hear about one of the disciples. And Thomas, it says in parenthetical statement, also called the twin. Have we heard Thomas referred to as anything else? Doubting Thomas. Thomas has the notoriety of being referred to throughout time, throughout the ages, as being known as Doubting Thomas. I read a statement this past week that that name that's attached to Thomas, Doubting, goes in front of him like a pimple on a face. You know it's there, and you recognize it, and you think everybody's staring at it. We've all had those moments, right? <clears throat> Thomas is stuck with this name attached to him. Just because he had this moment where he was saying to the other disciples, unless I have a chance to experience firsthand, then I won't actually be as full in my spirit as you are. I mean, let's, let's cut to the chase here. If everybody that was sitting in this church was able to have a physical contact, a face-to-face -face conversation with God, was able to hold God's hand, except you. Rhonda's power. Right? That's sad. If everyone else in this sanctuary, except you, had a chance, that would be heartbreaking. That would be gut-wrenching. We would desire some level of, hey God, can you maybe give me a chance too? Is there something wrong with me that my faith isn't strong enough? Why did they get to see, but I didn't? Why did they get to touch, but I didn't? There is a level of reality and human honesty that comes out in the person of who Thomas is. And we are the ones who have attached this moniker of Thomas being known as the doubter. But you know, it wasn't that long ago in our scriptural readings that if we turn back the pages, in fact, and go to the understanding about Lazarus in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha sent messengers off to go and get Jesus to return because Lazarus was sick and he was dying of his illness. 
And Jesus' response Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I am not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And the disciples are all fussed up. They don't want to go back because nothing good will come from their return. But in verse 16 of chapter 11, in the midst of all of the scoffing and the naysaying of the other disciples, Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was the one who offered this rallying cry to his fellow disciples when they were scoffing and saying, we're not going back. They're hunting us down. They're looking for us. They want to persecute us. They want to put us to death. Lazarus is the one who speaks up boldly and courageously and gives the rallying cry to his fellow disciples and said, let's go! Even if that means we're going to be put to death, let's go! Let's go. <laughs> but Thomas isn't known for his rallying cry. Thomas isn't labeled bold Thomas. Thomas isn't called Courageous Thomas. Thomas isn't called Warrior Voice Thomas. Thomas is called Doubting. Doubting Thomas. But isn't that our way? I mean, really. We have Drunk Dave and Pothead Pete. We have Sassy Sally. We have Loser Larry. And I apologize, I'm not labeling any of you. <laughs> but we immediately stoop to that low level, right? When there is some kind of an interaction or a negative failure or some kind of a breaking point with us, that's what we gravitate towards. We can name the people in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our school. We can label those people with monikers of just who they are, what they've done, and they're not always the positive things, right? We often warn our children, in fact, stay away from so-and-so. They're a no-good something-something. And Thomas is labeled because of his doubts. But it wasn't long ago in our scripture that we got to hear he was the one who, in fact, was charging... <coughs> the disciples to step up with their faith. Be bold. Let us go back, even if that means that we die with him. So all of a sudden, when we see this image of Jesus coming to the disciples in the upper room, why have we labeled Thomas with this kind of a mindset? Oh, you, would, you doubter. Wait a second. The ones that are calling you the doubter are the ones who ran away. They're the ones who couldn't face the crucifixion. They're the ones who tucked themselves away in the upper room, locked all the doors, shut all the windows, moved the tables and chairs against everything, barring it solidly shut. And now they're telling Thomas, 
Oh, ye of little faith. And yet Jesus, if you read this scripture, read it with the, the truth of what comes out. There was nothing, no barrier, no lock, no table, no chair, no personality, no nothing that could keep Jesus from entering that space and making it be a holy place. It said, in fact, Jesus entered that room even though it was locked. And it said that Jesus didn't even go to the doorknob and turn the doorknob. Jesus didn't open a latch. Jesus didn't throw open a window. Jesus just comes in. It is the holy presence of recognizing that no matter what barrier of protection we might throw around ourselves, because if we bear witness to that, when we shut a door, when we lock a window, when we throw a lock on, what are we doing? We're keeping somebody out. Jesus cannot be kept out of your business. Praise God. Like gravitate with me on that. Praise God. Jesus can't be locked out of your business. No matter what it is that you're doing, good, bad, or indifferent, and everywhere in between, Jesus can't be locked out of it. Jesus can waltz right in and be revealed and be seen. And that's exactly what Jesus is responding. As Thomas is saying, I, 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 need, I need this. I need this. I need to be able to touch I need to have the kind of faithfulness that lets me hold him one more time. Jesus doesn't deny that request. The disciples denied that request. The, the, the disciples denied that request of Thomas by actually poking and prodding and saying, oh, you, you doubter, you doubter. Jesus did not deny the request. In fact, Jesus appeared the exact same way that he had done to the other disciples, but more profoundly went to Thomas himself and said, here I am. Stick, stick your fingers in the nail holes of my hands. Stick your hand all the way up into my side if, if you need to. And then he goes even further and makes a proclamation. Jesus says, blessed are you because you've had the chance to see me and touch me and stick your fingers into the nail holes. But blessed even more are those who will not be able to see and do that and yet believe. Now do you want to have your minds blown? Jesus said that you and I are more blessed than his disciples. Because this is referring to you and I. Blessed more are those gathered right there in the sanctuary that you're preaching to this morning, John. Blessed are them because they weren't here in the upper room. And they didn't get to stick their, their fingers into the holes on my hands or into my side. Blessed are they even more because they believe and they didn't have to touch me because I have chosen to come through every barrier that they put in front of them. I choose to come through every locked door and window 
that separates them. I choose to cut through every sin and every darkness and every separating point. I choose to walk through it all so that they could believe. I choose to be seen in ways that far surpass our understanding. Our God continues to be in the business of not labeling us with adjectives about our lowest common denominator. Although I think if Jesus was about to do it, he would probably label us as the sinning saints. Because every single one of us is a sinner in need of forgiveness. And we have a chance to be made into a saint. Because that's exactly how Jesus sees us. We are the sinning saints. Sinning because that's our business as humans. But saints because that's who Jesus makes us. Through his power of redemption. And his salvation on the cross. We are sinning saints. But I think if we actually went further into the authenticity of what it is that Jesus sees us as, you ready for this? John, Ruth, Susie, Dan. Eric, Paula, he sees us for who we are. He sees us for who he made us to be. And the name that he calls every single one of us is more profound and more blessed than the name we were given at birth. Jesus refers to every single one of us as beloved. Be loved. When we can hear that all of the things that separate us are moved aside. When all of the seeds of doubt get pushed away, when all of our doubts and our fears and our hurt and our pain and our anger, Jesus walks through it all. He comes right through that locked door and looks at us simply and says, here I am. Be loved. Because our God is seen. How are you and I seeing God in our lives today? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. There isn't a single person in this room. Not a single one of you. Young, old. New Christian, old Christian, non-believer, doubter, skeptic, fearful, hurt, angry, addicted. None of those things are a locked door that God doesn't want to come through today. Every single one of us in this place... Jesus wants to come to and be seen. <clears throat> and he wants to take you right where you are and tell you, be loved because you are my beloved. None of you are so broken 
none of you are so hurt. None of you are so separated from God that he doesn't want to make a difference today. Our God wants to be seen for you like he's never been seen before. So if that means that you need to say, Lord, reveal yourself so I can stick my fingers in your nail holes. Jesus continues to walk through those walls. Jesus continues to be seen. Open your eyes, your ears, your heart, your life, and you will see Jesus revealed for you like he's never been revealed before. <clears throat> Have the boldness as well as the doubt of Thomas <clears throat> to boldly go in your faith, but also be truthful in your fears. Because God takes both and blesses it. Our God lived for you and I. He's invested himself in us that changes everything. This is a day of new beginnings for us. Be loved because our God is seen. He is seen because he is alive. Let us pray. Lord God, you are revealed before us. We bear witness to the faithfulness of just what it is you've done on our behalf. May we be made into that new image, that new creation, in and through your love. You call us beloved. Now may we live into it, that we might be loved and find faith in the midst of doubt. Might find grace in the midst of fear. Might find hope, inspiration, truth, peace, mercy, and a new day dawning. May we open our eyes and see you fully before our eyes. We love you, Lord. Forgive us and move us into right relationship with you and with one another through the grace, mercy, peace, hope, and love of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people say, Amen. <clears throat> if you are able, may we join our voices together as we sing our final hymn, Lord of the Dance. And if you are able, we might stand together.
that'll never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. Our Lord is seen in this place, in your hearts, in your lives. Let him be seen in and through the way that you offer that hope, that faith, and that love. So go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May you be blessed to be a blessing unto others through Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Wherever you may be.